Hey everyone, Chang here and welcome to my channel. Now, these video series can probably kill the rest of my box of markers. Now, I mentioned previously in an introduction, I'm gonna link to the description down below, but basically I'm gonna go over every single one of those C best practice exam questions that the actual organization released out. For each of them, I'm not only gonna just go over how to solve them, I'm gonna go over the core topics that they expect from each and every one of the problem. And more importantly, I wanna point out potential variations that either can make the problem a little more difficult, a little more interesting, or some potential pitfall that they put in there hoping that you would fall under, right? So, in I guess fear, or not fear, in basically, yeah, fear of this video being way too long, let's just begin right away. All right, so let's go over the first problem. And of course, you know, the majority of the problems are gonna be word problems, our favorite, right? Now, I'm gonna put a link to the actual practice exam so that you guys can go over and try to solve it all yourself, right? If you guys got the answer, you understand what's going on, great. If you do not, then hopefully this video or at least a future video in this series will answer that specific question. So let's look at this really quickly. So the first problem, during a semester, a student received a score of 76, 80, 83, 71, 80, and 78. On the six tests that the student took, what is the student's average for these six tests? Now. This is a standard average problem. So basically asking if you understand the formula or know how to use the formula of finding the average or finding the means, right? And then answering the question. Now here's the thing though, they're definitely most likely gonna use different words, right? They could use average, which is what they use in this practice exam, but it's more than fair game if they decide to say the word mean. Mean is just another word for average. So be very careful of that, right? Don't get thrown off just because of the vocabulary. So the formula for average is fairly simple. It's basically on the top, right, is the sum of all the given numbers. Sum of all given numbers. And the bottom is basically the total amount of numbers. Amount of numbers. Now, what does that mean? Well, the sum is fairly simple. These are the six score that they gave you. You're gonna add them all together and figure out the total. Right? The total amount of numbers is slightly different. What it means is that basically how many given numbers are you presented with, right? So in this case, you have this plus this plus this plus this plus this plus this will be on top. That's the sum. The total amount, they emphasize it, right? They say it's six twice, but if you count all the numbers, also six as well. The total amount of given numbers is just six. So. Let's look at how to solve this very quickly, right? So first and foremost, we have to add each and every one of them together. We have 76, 80, 83, 71, 80 again, and 78. And you wanna add them all together. What is that? Okay, so that's 160 right here. This one is a four, uh, 147, so add them together, that's 307, plus this one is 390, 390 plus this one is uh, 468. So that's 468. And that's gonna be what's on top. The bottom, we know now, there's six total numbers, so we're gonna divide it by six, right? So after we carry this out, hopefully you can see that, that's what, 70, uh, 78, right? 78 is your average or your mean. So that's fairly simple. Now, a way that this could potentially be presented to make it slightly more challenging, right, is that they might give you a, a scenario where, all right, so your current average score is blah, blah, right? Now you've got one more test, right? What is your new average? So they'll do something like that maybe. And in that sense, that means you have to be able to use this twice, right? Reverse it and figure out basically the sum of the given number because they would probably give you the total amount of tests before and then you have one more, all of a sudden your total amount is different and your sum is different and you use the same formula to figure out the average. That would be a way of making a problem like this a little more difficult, but if they release something like this, most likely they're not gonna do something like that, but it doesn't hurt to practice, right? Know your formula for finding the means and how to utilize it and you're good to go for this kind of problem. All right, so here's our second problem, and of course it's a long one, right? We have this table right here. We have algebra, trigonometry, and geometry, the total number of questions on each and every one of the section, and the number of correct 
answers, right? So on the three sections of a math test, a student correctly answered the number of questions shown in the table above. This is the table. What percentage of the questions on the entire test did the student answer correctly? Now, hopefully you guys realize, right, it's heavily emphasized in this question itself. It shows you exactly what it's talking about and that is percentage. Remember that percentage is basically the desired number over total numbers, right? Now this can get a little tricky because it depends on the context itself, right? This one is a fairly easy worded problem, right? So in this case, it's saying what's the percentage of the, on the entire test that the student answered correctly. So what is the desired number? Well, the, the desired number is basically the correct answers, right? And the total number is basically the total number of questions. That's fairly simple, right? Now, here's the thing though. Keep in mind that since it's talking about percentage, it's gonna ask in terms of percentage. Don't give it to them in decimals, right? Even though certain situations, the decimal is the correct answer. If they're asking for specifically percentage, hopefully they make it a little clear with these selections that you guys have, right? That you're choosing a percentage value, right? If they don't, then most likely your decimal representation is correct. So let's look at this really quickly. All right, so desired number. These are all of the correct answer. What is that? That's 37, 48, right? Total 48 over, now the number of questions, what is that? That's uh, 40 and then that's 60. Right there, right? So you have a fraction and now you can simplify it. Well, in this case, you can see that you can take out what? Six, no, yeah, six. All right, so that's gonna be eight over 10. You can take out a little more. That's gonna be what, four over five. That's 80% or 0.8, right? So in this case, 0.8, if they're asking for decimal, 80% if you're asked for the actual percentage. Now, this is fairly simple because it's asking what is the percentage of the entire test. Be very careful. There's so many variations that you can go with this, right? They can go something along the line is what is the percentage of correct answer on just the algebra section or even with algebra and trig. So at that point, your total number is just only going to be these two or just this one. And your desired number is only either gonna be these two or this one or any variations of that, right? So even though this means that, oh, all we have to do is add these guys and these guys and then divide it, depending on the wording of the question, it might not be the case. So that's a potential variations that you would encounter. Make sure you always read the context of the problem itself and see what the focus is on. It's always whatever you desire over a total number of basically the context, right? If it's just algebra, then it's gonna be a total number of only algebra. If it's just trig, total number of only trig. If it's geo, total number of only geo. If it's a mix of those two, you get the idea. So there you go, that is the second question and hopefully it's not that bad. Let's look at the third one. All right, so take 427, we are beginning now. Just kidding. All right, this is a reshoot of the problem number three of the CBEST practice exam. Now, the reason for that is because guess what? While watching the video, you know, it's amazing, it's amazing, it's amazing, bam, technology fails on you. So, uh, anyone who's rooting for AI to rule us, you know, think twice. All right, so here's our problem, right? We have our terrible drawing of a bridge because I am the wonderful artist, right? And we have this lovely ruler right here. Now, the problem is a fairly simple problem. It's a ratio problem, it's a scaling problem, however you wanna call it, right? If the actual length of the bridge is 4,200 feet, then what is the scale of the diagram of the bridge? So there's our bridge. This is a, a scaled down version, of course, you know, because you have your ruler. And then you have the actual length, which is 4,200. So how can we figure out basically what the scale is? Now, here's the thing. We know this is 4,200. The only thing I can see potentially going wrong when you're trying to do a scale is, well, let's look at this really quickly, right? It doesn't start here. This is our zero, right? Then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six tick marks. So it's very tempted to say, oh, okay, so we have six to 4,200. So that therefore, you know, all we have to do is six right here as what's in the ruler. And then the ratio is probably 4,200. And then if we really wanted to figure out what it is, then we start dividing by six on both sides because you know, it's a scale, right? So you divide by six on both sides, you get your answer, right? So what's that? That's a one and then that is 700. Okay, cool, right, right? No, the reason for that is, like I said, it doesn't start at zero. 
starts at one. That's the caveat that I could potentially see going wrong in this problem. Other than that, it's fairly simple. If we look at it this way, we start here and we end here. That's actually one, two, three, four, five, five tick marks, right? So rather than six to 4,200, 4, right? We have five to 4,200. And once again, right, we can start scaling down. Basically, when we are asking for a scale, if you guys are, have seen maps and all that stuff, you know, uh, because who, who reads a map nowadays, right? We have only Google Maps and occasionally MapQuest. Uh, so we have one, two, blah, 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 blah. That's basically a scale, right? Usually we want it to be scaled down to a single unit in relation to another. So this is five to 4,200. If we want to scale it down to one, all we have to do is divide here by five and divide here by five since they are a ratio. So when you do that, well, luckily for us, five divided by five is one. And then if you are not sure, 4,200 divided by five, if I remember correctly, uh, that's very simple, 840. And I think that's one of the answer. If not, then I made a huge blunder on this problem. So this should be our answer. Now, in order to practice more of this, it's fairly simple, right? Imagine if you are stretching and shrinking this bridge on, I don't know, Photoshop, whatever, right? You can change it up. Let's say if I stretched it and I started all the way there, well, there you go. That's one way to go about it. What if I say I stretched it and, or I shrink it and then now it starts here, right? All of a sudden you're working with four or three or whatsoever. That is a way to practice scaling. Of course, you can always scour the lovely internet and look at a lot of different problems that still just relies on scaling. Remember the key fact is to figure out where it starts, where it ends, and you want to simplify, you want to convert it to the point where you have one is in relation to blah, 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 right? That's how you would find a scale of something. So there you go. Problem number three, retake. All right, so let's look at our fourth question. Now this fourth question is slightly odd because normally we won't encounter, I guess you could say, a test question that falls under this kind of category. This is one of those, do you understand measurement unit? Are you good at estimating gathering information? Mainly just basically, <laughs> do you have common sense, right? Now, here's the thing though. I tend to get these kind of questions wrong because I try to be a smart ass about it, right? So, one key acronym to always remember, K-I-S-S, -S, KISS, right? Now, that sounds lovely, but remember what it stands for. Keep it simple. Stupid. Ah. And of course I spell, misspell stupid. Stupid, right? Stupid right here. All right, so uh, keep it simple, stupid. Now, the reason for that is fairly simple, right? When they're asking for this, they're just asking for the most basic, the easiest to work with. So if we're looking for the appropriate unit to measure the weight of a pencil, right? First and foremost, whichever one is not a weight measurement, then you probably can get rid of it. Quartz, pints, you can get rid of it. Now you have these three. These three are completely valid. If you have a scale that's super precise, right, you can definitely set it in pound and try to get it. It's gonna be point something, 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 something of a pound. And of course, ton is gonna be a super long decimal, but still work as well. But hopefully you guys realize, common sense wise, use the one that's most appropriate, the one that can be measured the most accurate in terms of an everyday scale. So in this case, the answer is in ounces. Now, the caveat with this is that these are all basically, what is it, imperial measuring units, right? If you're so used to metric, you have to get at least a general understanding of the rough range of weight measurement in terms of imperial, right? There might be a situation where they ask you in terms of metric, but that's usually in like actual measurement. In stuff like this where they're just trying to see if you can figure out what is the best unit, they most likely will use imperial instead just so you can understand that pound is significantly larger than ounce and of course ton is significantly larger than both, right? So that's the whole point of these kind of questions. There's really not anything that you can potentially go wrong with unless you don't follow this, right? You try to be smart about it, you try to be, oh, but technically I can, that's when it gets you, right? Read the question as it is, keep it as simple as possible, and most of the time you will just get questions like this correct. So there's your question number four. 
right, so here is our next question. Miss Gutierrez needs to order rope for her gym class of 32 students. Each student will receive a piece of rope that is five foot eight inches. What is the total length of the rope Miss Gutierrez need to order for her class? Now, this is a fairly simple and straightforward problem. The only caveat is the understanding of how to convert feet to inches, right? So once again, it's another one of those you need to have a general understanding of measurement units. So in this case, it's a multiplication problem. Plain and simple. You have 32 students. Each of them are in need five foot eight inches of rope. So all you have to do is just multiply them together. So you would have 32 times five foot and eight inches. Now you can actually break it down to two different things, right? 32 times five foot and then 32 times eight inches and see what happens. Because I mean, that will make our lives a little easier. 32 times five foot. That's fairly simple. That's what? Uh, 150, 160, right? So that's going to be 160 foot feet. Okay, cool. Now, the other thing is that we also have this right here, 32 times 8 inches. 32 times 8 inches. Now, that's 240, 256. 256 inches, right? Plain and simple. Now, the problem is that most likely the answer is not going to allow you to have something like that. It's probably going to be in its most simplified form, meaning that this inch right, is going to be converted into feet until you really can't convert anymore. Now, the key is fairly simple, right? 12 inch is to one foot. So if you're used to metric, you got to be careful. That's at least one thing that you probably have to memorize to save your butt. So there it is, 12 inches to one foot. So 256, you're going to divide by 12, just to see how many foot there are, right? So that goes in there two times, right? That's 24, and then you have one six, it goes in there one time, that's 12, you have four, so remainder four. So technically, if you add it all together, you're gonna have 181 foot and four inches would be your answer, okay? Now, there are caveats, there are potential ways to make this problem a little more difficult or potential errors. So first and foremost, this is as precise as we can really get based on the information. Now, if they say estimate, or for example, right, you, you can't get ropes in specific inches. Maybe you have to only get them in however many feet. So it, the closest thing you would have to get to make sure that everyone has it would have to be 182 feet. So you gotta be careful the wording of the problem. This one, I remember, if I remember correctly, this is one of the answers. This is your answer is great. But some of them is gonna be, all right, what is the minimum amount of rope that you can get if you only can get it in like whole numbers? Or if you only can get it in like, in this case, feet? Or if you can get it only in inches? If they only want it in inches, if they only want it in feet? You, there's so many ways to spin this problem. So you have to be comfortable with being able to convert feet to inches, inches to feet, and understanding in that situation, right, what you're doing, right? If you're multiplying and you want them in the mixed variations, great. If you're multiplying in inches, well, guess what? You have to convert five foot to all inches plus the eight inch and then multiply or vice versa. If it's all in feet afterwards, then you have to find whatever is left over and then, you know, bring it up to the next one just as a proper estimate. So that's just ways to finagle, work with this problem to make it a little more difficult just to make sure that you guys are paying attention. But luckily for this one, it's a simple problem. There it is. So there you have it. That's the first five problems of the CBEST practice exam. Now, once again, yes, some of the question itself is gonna be fairly simple, fairly straightforward. The whole purpose of this is, yes, to walk you through the question to make sure you guys know what topic is being covered, what is expected, but more importantly, to give you guys ideas of how to develop these problems into something more complicated, because guess what? Once you guys get into the habit and can develop more complicated problems based on these guys and be able to solve them or have a general idea of how to go about solving them, right? This is gonna be super simple. You guys are gonna conquer the exam like crazy. And well, guess what? Then you guys are qualified to become substitute teachers in the wonderful state of California, right? So there it is, right? As the series goes on, there are gonna be questions that are gonna be fairly similar. Some of them are gonna be a little more complicated. Some of them are gonna be a little easier, but hopefully as you guys follow along with the series, you guys will feel more prepared. If you guys wanna take the exam, great. If you don't, at least know that you are more than qualified. Thank you for watching this video. If you haven't already, please like, comment, and subscribe. I will see you in the next video of this series.